Opening act. She let him get her drunk. It was easy with martinis. One hour and the floor shimmered. Two hours and the chandeliers danced. He'd selected a hotel bar, murmur-filled and business-like, the sort of place that stocked 40 grams of scotch and no jukebox. Cleaner than usual dives and accordingly more expensive. But over the course of their 35 pre-date emails, he'd insisted on paying, and she was inclined to let him. They were both working entry level. He was in finance, she was in PR. He told her he hated his job after the first martini. She told him she liked that he told her he hated his job, then admitted that she also hated her job, but had been scared to say so. Not exactly scared to be precise, rather it hadn't occurred to her to admit she hated her job so early on the first date. Maybe she hated her job less than he did. Definitely he jumped in, explaining that his dream was to own a coffee shop, rising early to review pastry deliveries and chat up customers and tinker with coffee bean combinations, in the evening hosting art receptions and bluegrass solo acts and hipster literary events. <laughs> one, of, one of those coffee shops that stayed open until midnight so grad students could do their grading curled up with a macchiato. She wondered if he'd smell like coffee all the time. Almost everybody liked the smell of coffee, she supposed, but there were limits. She imagined a deep, slumbering cone of lens settling into his bed, a lighter French rose sweat on his towels, a nutty Arabica bean odor saturating his car, his shoes, his hair. He probably would notice after the first day, same way her grandparents couldn't smell the pulp mill after 60 years, even when she tasted it in her cereal. She almost told him this story, but after a long, reflective martini sip, she opted to hold it in reserve until he earned it. He stopped talking after the fourth martini. She stopped too, attempting to demonstrate a comfort with silence that she hadn't truly mastered, and wound up dropping her glass. Incredibly, it didn't shatter, and as they rushed to retrieve it, they bonked heads with a drunken ferocity that would seem like an obvious sign years later. In the moment, though, they just felt silly and too inebriated, her yelping uncontrollably and him hiccuping in squirmy chipmunk progressions, which she adeptly interpreted as a sign he'd ventured beyond drunkville and into a dirtier land of second-guessing and lonesomeness. Floundering, she told him that his fly was unopened, whereupon he said that the fifth button on her blouse had come undone, mm -hmm. and while neither point was true, they both laughed like conniving children. <laughs> the next martini went down at rocket ship speed, and when he leaned over to kiss her, she let him in on the second try. It wasn't the kind of bar you could make out in for long, so they caught a cab to a pub near her place. In the taxi, a violet lust throttled her, an all-body craving for a deep black kiss in the deep black night, his hand running up her skirt, the cabbie cursing them in Farsi. <laughs> to be bad, pornographically bad. Broken windows and police weren't bad, then melt into him like a bo box of popsicles left in the trunk. It was something she wouldn't regret. But when she slipped her head onto his shoulder, he jumped like he'd been whacked with a cattle prod, then reminded her that he was from Tennessee. And being from Tennessee, it was required that he enjoy country music, which shouldn't come as an unwelcome surprise, as his preference for country music was clearly detailed in his Match.com profile. <laughs> He'd run into trouble on the subject before. The violet lust surfaced, and she grabbed his shirt and tried to kiss him deeply, blackly, but he wiggled out of it, a ghost-like fade, transmogrifying her, her gulps into a light kiss like a falling leaf. She looked out her window at the flotilla of taxi cabs speeding to infinite destinations, the endless lives she could be living. Should she feel rejected? She would with other guys, but they would also be texting by now, or more likely gone, dropped in a corner to find an alternative sexual receptacle. Instead, he was singing, badly, a cowboy ditty about losing a woman over a rodeo bet, thrown ten feet off a bronco, and blood in his coffee the next morning. Always with the coffee, she realized, and had to get that coffee shop. His voice came out like a traveling guitar austere and beaten by a lifetime of motels. Hungry, she thought. He sounded so wonderfully hungry. Woo!